My name is Andrew Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the new museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the new museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's panel conversation, Other Than Human Relationships, Towards a New Ethics of Care. This program will include artists Daniel Lee and Bernardo Masquiera, is the curatorial fellow at the new museum. Programs like this are core to the museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire new museum team for their help bringing this program together. New museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council and digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief biographical notes about tonight's speakers. Daniel Lee is a trans non-binary Indonesian Brazilian artist currently based in, Br in Berlin. For the past decade, Lee has been working in partnership with other than human and human beings, using organic material to create large scale installations that are constantly in transmutation. In their works, Lee uses the presence and the idea of rottenness to undo the binary representation of life and death. They have had recent solo exhibitions at the Kunstlerhaus Bethanien in Berlin, Jupiter Artland in Edinburgh, Performium Vienna, and Change Change Budapest. Their work has been included in group exhibitions at numerous venues, including Museo del Arte Moderna in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, a tonal festival in Berlin, Berlinsche Gallery in Berlin, Solar dos Abacex in Rio de Janeiro, Cementi Institute for Art and Society in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, Osage Foundation in Hong Kong, the 14th Yogyakarta Biennial, and Fresta's Art Triennial in Brazil. Bernardo Masquiera is a curator, writer, and researcher based in New York. He is the ISLA Curatorial Fellow at the New Museum of New York and Artistic Director of Solar dos Abraxasis in Rio de Janeiro. Now a few logistical notes. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there's time, our speakers will answer questions throughout. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, I turn the conversation over to tonight's Marta, moderator, Bernardo Masquiera. Bernardo. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here with us tonight. I'm Bernardo Mosquera, he's the curatorial fellow here at the New Museum and curator of the show, Daniel Lee, Unnamed Entities. Currently on view at the New Museum through June 5th. If you're in New York City and you haven't seen the show yet, please come see it together with the outstanding Faith Ringgold, um, um, American People and screen series, Patricia Dominguez. Tonight, uh, I'm going to be in conversation with Daniel Lee. I'll just make a quick introduction about Daniel about unnamed entities and about this conversation and uh, at, the, at any time uh, if you have questions just type um, them at the q a function here at zoom for the past uh, 12 years dan has been developing different techniques to use organic material in order to create large-scale installations that are constantly in transmutation in their work some um, sometimes we can find plants sprouting, mushrooms growing, everything getting rotten, colors changing, texture, uh, textures changing in a real dance with the mystery that brings the unpredictable into the work itself. Daniel Lee understand, uh, understands their work as living entities, as beings that are alive, that have awareness and agency. Something very important in their work is this long investigation about life and death. Unnamed entities, for example, is an invitation for us to think about life and death in non-binary ways. If conventionally and schematically, the Western science have been describing the cycles of life as maybe being born, growing, reproducing, and dying, then is proposing this cycle to be being born, dying, and multiplying, 
thinking about the process of death and rotting as a process of multiplication of life. Another important issue in Dan's work is the fact that they develop their work always in collaboration with forces that they call other than human beings, beings such as bacteria, fungi, plants, animals, minerals, um, spirits, ancestors, etc. In this conversation today, we're going to discuss Daniel Lee's practice in general, our show Unnamed Entities, um, but we're going to have a bigger focus on these other than humans uh, relationships. Um, Daniel, I know you're there. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I know it's Hi. quite late in Berlin. Uh, uh, if you want to come say hello to everyone and also introduce yourself and your practice in your own words before we dive into this conversation. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Bernardo, for being here. Thank you for the Mini Museum. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Um, this both introduction from Andrew and Bernardo, I feel very seen. I feel very happy about it. Uh, just a brief introduction myself. My pronouns are they, them. Um, Daniel, um, and just to start this conversation over there, whatever most of people are listening to me is the 26th of April, but here where I'm standing is in Berlin, it's the 27th already of April, and today marks the one year of uh, the anniversary of death of Lillian King. Lillian King has been one of the fundamental loves of my life and also my father. Lee has died of victim of COVID-19, and tonight with this one year, as Bernard and I were saying, how remarkable the mystery and encounters and the timings are happening. And doing this conversation on, on this one year anniversary for me is very profound because many things from this process of creation and thinking about existence and how I am still in this world um, is very much related with this process of grieving and beyond grieving and living and all this flux that has been going around this past year. Uh, regarding my practice, I think this introduction has been very beautiful and I thank so much for tonight. Oh, there has been like in the description of this conversation, one very strong uh, sentence, which is how can interspecies relationships be ethically cultivated to transform ecosystems? That's a very large question, which I by no means come here in a sense to bring a answer. I think this is a large question that many fields of knowledge, many fields of expertise are thinking about and doing practice around it. My perspective is coming from art, it's coming from art research and also my curiosity to go beyond other fields and throughout art, having this quality to be able to approach many other expertise from the hegemonical to non-hegemonical construction of thoughts. Thinking about this word ecosystem uh, that is very much related with this relationship, first, is try to think about what is this relationship between us and then the ecosystem, then pretty much what is also ecosystem itself. I found a very interesting definition, which is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. And thus, I think a little bit that perhaps the first ecosystem that we start to have a relationship is our own body, understanding that our body is also composed by organs, by bacteria, by fungi, a diversity of them, but not only in this sense of these classifications, but as well, the stories that come from previous ones around us, how we are shaped by society, how we are shaped by affection, how we are shaped by trauma as well. And thus, I think a bit about the layers of these ecosystems, but more specifically regarding the topics of tonight and regarding the theme of the exhibition and then the, the title of the exhibition and then and then entities um, specifically because the proposition in the new museum is an ambience of the installation how to relate with this other than humans how this relationship within the space can open other possibilities of communications uh, that's brief introduction of mine i also like mm -hmm. to thank and if I go way too far away, Bernard, please bring me back. 
Never. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, then I would love if you could talk a little bit about unnamed entity, uh, the work we're showing right now at the museum, um, especially for those who haven't seen the work but are in New York City or those who are in other cities or countries or for any other reason cannot come to the show. I would love if you could describe the work and tell us a little bit about what led you to make this piece, what you want to inspire with this piece that I know it's uh, something very important for you. Um, and maybe while you, you answer that, maybe we can show some images that we prepared Sure. Uh, after your invitation, and also I've been also in contact with Margot Norton, who's also creator uh, of the museum. We've been talking for a while to create a project for the lobby gallery, which is on the ground floor of the new museum. And due to the pandemic, um, it was I wasn't able to do a site visit before. Usually, in my practice, and most often. Uh, the work starts from the venue. The work starts from a listening process of understanding what has been the story, what is the architecture features of the space like, and also for me to feel the space. And from that, uh, the installations start to come together with what I've been developing in my artistic practice. Uh, for unnamed entities, being my first uh, US uh, solo exhibition, I felt it was very important to present this uh, research and present uh, the key things that I've been thinking about it, practicing about it, and more specifically, this relationship with the other than humans. And thus, I think, which is very strong when we were talking about this exhibition, Bernardo, we were also thinking about what would be the appropriate name and the strongest name about it. And then looking the way I was describing the elements that are very important and create this ambience. In the past, I often, often use the description of it, um, flowers, uh, ceramic pots, and unnamed entities. Because in the experience of the exhibition, which is a whole environment composed by elements who are changing throughout time, and then in this time span of the exhibition, which in the case of the new museum will be four months, many changes are happening because there are many living beings there from visible to invisible. And those classifications, which is, are not part of my interest to understand what are they, I felt also in this incapacity to classify them, incapacity to obtain them, which is not at all my goal, I felt this could be, we felt this could be a very powerful thing. The, 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 something about the uh, power and strength of the void, of the silence, and how much this title of the exhibition, this name of the exhibition could bring forth. A uh, bit of many key elements that I've been researching and practicing with the installation practice. So furthermore, a name entities, is the creation of ambience, is a, a proposal of the experience. We would like to propose everybody to who is listening and can go uh, to the venue to be there. It's pretty much that's the research about it, be inside the space, be inside of that venue, and what does that happen? And that's also something that I'm quite intrigued to listen to people. How has their experience been like being in that environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for sure. I think there's something uh, very, very important in, in what you're saying. Um, this idea of, of maybe ambience. I don't know if it's if that's uh, the word for what I'm I'm gonna try to describe. But there's certainly something in this show and in this in this work that is not what you see, what you can identify, but is present. Um, and that's and that's very powerful, and that's and that's what I guess makes us uh, find very often in the space people meditating in a corner, or people crying, or people who send us messages after um, trying to describe sensations and relationships that they create in the space that they cannot give name for them. 
and that's something that I find very uh, beautiful. And this is impossible to be totally um, represented in images. And and you know that one of the most um, um, important things that I guess um, for this show, and that is in, and that is also impossible to transmit through through images and videos, is this is the smell of it. I've been giving countless guided tours in our show, and in every single group, one of the most one of the first comments that I that I get is about the smell. I remember the first group that I welcome in the space. It was a group called Youth Spectrum Art Group, uh, which is an, an initiative of our educational uh, education department with teens mostly. And one of the participants get into, you know, this group that has been working with you actually. Uh, and one of the participants uh, got into the space and said, wow, it smells like something that is alive. And museums usually smell like bleach, like cleaning products. I've never noticed that, but it's, it's definitely true. Um, and, and I know that the smell as well, um, the spiritual dimension of the work is part of what you call invisible architecture. It's one of, one of, the, of, of the concepts that you create to kind of embed or accompany your, your work. Could you talk a little bit about, about this concept? Because I know that it's very important for you. Um, I think there are some steps to get to this concept of invisible architecture. First, in this partnership with this other than humans, what we do, me as artists, um, assistants, technicians, producers, institutions, we all uh, create these environments and also we create kind of like a home for these beings to be there. I also understand it's my, it's an invitation. Once we were like, doing this a lot of people were asking oh, are, are we gonna have mushrooms are they gonna come i was like i don't know we're gonna invite them we're gonna try to create a very uh, warm and very uh, comfortable place for them to be there but if they're gonna be there or not it's up to them um we're gonna try our best and but also not only in this sense but there are some who are everywhere like for instance right now around everybody who's listening to us right now there are invisible to our eyes organisms surrounding us from spores, from um, bacteria. We are still under a current pandemic and a lot about the pandemic has been dealing with invisible other than human, which is the virus called COVID-19. Uh, thus, there are some structures also in the installation, specifically the ceramics, the Hakata vases. Those vases are filled with plant-based organic matter. Many of this invisible to our, our eyes, organisms, they appropriate this environment, transform that into a home, and then they start to ferment, rot, decompose, and be there. And that is very specific to the lobby gallery, the organisms who are there, very specific to New York, very specific to the neighborhood where they are at. But also with these other elements who are there, flowers drying out, the soil, uh, the decaying processes, the many others who many times there are also surprising to us. They are um, in this sense of communication, which I think is very much about this panel right now. For me, the smell is the first one to acknowledge there's something else existing there. And thus, as you navigate through the spaces of the installations, and you might be filling one area, the smell of the flowers, and then the other, the smell of this fermentation, but also it's very much related with your memory and your affections. I, I find quite interesting when I ask people, how was your experience like? What was the smells that you enjoy? And having different opinions, like some people say, oh, I really like that fermented smell, or people having a very opposite relation to it. But furthermore, uh, as you go through the exhibitions and the dimensions of it are constantly there present from tiny, small microorganisms and tiny plants or beginning of things to these large structures. There is this other one, which I, that's why I call like this uh, invisible architecture. So areas where you can find this types of smells and based upon your own experience of being in this world, how do you relate this, that smell? What does that trigger? As well, what we were, I was mentioning how this exhibition is a 
proposition of an experience. It's not only a mental or just a focusing our head experience that the majority of the senses are triggered here, but actually throughout the whole body. So many people talk about also as entering the lobby gallery, feeling a difference in the humidity, in the atmosphere, in uh, the temperature, uh, which is direct impact from those living entities who are there, living and dying entities that are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you've mentioned the, the terracotta vases, and there's something about that that I find very, very beautiful because your work is also challenging how we think about life, the idea of individual body and everything. And something that I always found very uh, striking about how this work transmutates is that those terracotta vases, they are constantly sweating because they're, they're porous and they create this kind of environment that is uh, very um, fertile, like per perfect for um, all the beings that are there. And some of the beings that are in the space are the bacteria that live on our skin, on our hair, in our stomach, and we're constantly breathing them out. So throughout time, parts, things that are part of our bodies start to live as part of this unnamed entity. And we share part of our body with, 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 this, um, with this installation. And you know, I find this very beautiful parts of all our bodies, people who have been um, um, spending time and sharing space with this entity, we start to, to grow together, to grow together. And I find this very beautiful. But maybe we could uh, take this, this moment also to talk a little about process. I think it, I think it, it would be very interesting. Like we had, we had a sketch, a very detailed and beautiful sketch before we got there. We locally source all the, the materials. Um, you got to the space. We spent two weeks in the space with uh, Amra and, and Sophia, two amazing people and, and amazing art handers who are part of our uh, team at the New Museum. Um, very thankful for, for them. And the project changed quite a bit in this, in this, in this time. Um, you spend time like connecting to, to the space, um, connecting to the forces that are, that, that are, that, that were there even before we start to build the work. Uh, you had many dreams with ancestors, with, with figures, bringing images, bringing reflections, and this all informed also the final piece. Uh, maybe it could be good if you could speak a little bit about the material and the immaterial, um, sides of this process? Uh, in, in a sense, I think this throughout this whole year, I've been grieving the death of Lee. Uh, working has been like one thing that helped me go through it, which is quite hard. Uh, and then I think a, a month after Lee died, I did an installation and I thought how to do an installation is an act of grieving. And this installation stayed for four months. And I was like, well, this duration, it was also an ex outdoor installation here in Berlin, which was even more um, impacted by the conditions of weather. Does every week something happened and very striking and very mysterious. Uh, and that was completely in the same sense of my feelings at that time, who was quite devastating. Uh, later on this, this year, I did another piece here in, in Berlin as well, another installation. And I was able to go constantly there, which is something that I quite enjoy, uh, going at least once a week. And then in this short period of time or twice a week, see the small changes and how they can be very impactful. Relating with the installation in this sense, visiting it, and also reflecting upon the process of grieving, I've been understanding that the installation and it's, it's a relationship. On my ethics, the installations, they are not reinstalled and they happen once, just like a relationship. And whatever it is, it's, it's possible to have with this installation is being there presence, seeing the images, being there with it. And what we have is what our technologies can uh, capture as a testimony, images, um, 
memories, uh, share stories about it. And once the installation is over, then it's over. The same way I've been thinking about the process of grieving. This one-on-one that I'm having right now with you, Bernardo, that we are having everybody here right now, it's only possible to be in the present in the process of this bodily living. Once that is over, what we have is, is the testimony of time. So pretty much in this relationship, I've been understanding following this moment being inside of the has been very much strong regarding that. And then thus, in this one year process, culminating with the unnamed entities in, in the new museum, is also very much about it. In one sense, this whole uh, experience of grief has been very devastating. But on the other side, I've been very much interested in the rituals around death and also have been very much interested in taking uh, concepts and taking out of the binarity and also what are the possibilities between them. In one sense, as my lover of my life, my father dies, uh, one of the fundamental loves of my life dies, I start and stumble upon a very condensed relationship with death. I start to realize how much Western societies are hypocritical about death and death as a condition of being human. Just like eating is a condition, but in our Western society, eating is very much integrated to our daily basis. Technology as our cell phones are very much developed in shape around it, but dying is not. And does making my grieving process very harsh as well because throughout my whole life i've been understanding now with this moment how we have been making a taboo around death this work has no means to be one specific uh reading of it actually it's pretty much about opening it up and being inside of the space and what that's possible to be you know so on this one side, which I think is amazing to listen to many um, testimonies about their people presence there, but I also find it quite fascinating when people bring critique of why is this, some, some people did a critique, why was that in the new museum? Why was the, this installation in the science museum? Which I think is also a very interesting question. So in the sense that the process is very much about, the, this is how I've been talking about much more my background, my, my uh, intimate background. Uh, it's also has been this is exhibition, my first museum solo exhibition. So there was a lot in this process of being able to create this environment, which I think is quite interesting to share as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to do you want to share it? Well, there was a day that we stalled and I thought it wasn't be able to we weren't be able to make it happen because uh, the new museum has a whole system of conservatorship with uh, air uh, temperature and humidity. And those things were very much uh, for the conservatorship of paintings, sculptures, and etc. for this type of work is actually very harmful. And I called you like, Bernardo, I don't think this is going to be able to call like kind of like freaking out. And but that was very important because then I understand it's not only my purpose, not only my uh, role and responsibility to bring these conditions of existence of these others to a, a venue, but our uh, relationship. So it's not only me as Daniel uh, inviting this other than humans, but we uh, yeah. as the community of the new museum and myself, how can we make this um, be a, a, a home? So this was quite interesting, but for a long time, I understood that many institutions who are very much concerned with conservatorship, which is very much anti-life, very much anti the passage of time, uh, very much anti rotting, all these concepts who are very much key to my research, rotting, passage of time, uh, going out the binary, uh, dealing with what stays after things change, uh, I, I think that was quite quite uh, interesting and gladly we were able to do it. And the interesting thing that only the lobby gallery is the place in the new museum that we can uh, be able to regulate the conditions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah as you mentioned that i might say that also that i don't know i need to um to honor and highlight how i be i believe it's very brave to accept and and support a show like that in a museum it's very uncommon um uncommon because it's tricky like we we are first we're lucky to be in an institution that is so like focus in supporting artists to to do their their best and second because the lobby gallery has a system that is completely separated from the, the rest of the building so we could um, regulate the the conditions but also we have a, a team that um, supported us in this process um, I think there's something uh, very interesting that I, that I, I would like to mention also that you or expand on what you uh, just just mentioned, which is, I think I think this work challenges the very idea of a, of what is a museum or what a museum can be in two ways. First, precisely uh, challenging this idea of the museum as a place of conservation, of preservation. Um, when we are putting a, a work there that is literally rotting, there is a very beautiful uh, review of this uh, of this show um written by uh justin Lins uh in the art guide that is very beautiful and touches in this uh, subject very beautifully and the second um way is precisely challenging the how we conceive the idea of an aesthetic experience if usually we imagine that the museum is a place where this human self subject active goes to have an experience observing objects that are passive and constant here is something else that is happening in this show when it, when we know that these beings that we are sharing space and time with is actually um also responding to us always observing us back aware of our presence uh, with agency in relation to our presence responding for example as in the in the um, example of the bacteria that said like responding to our presence like that for example it changes com completely who's active and who's and who is um just there to be to be seen and i think those those two things make this show very um very 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 touching for me uh, then and but well we talked a little bit about the process of how you materially and immaterially build um this first structure i like that you that you call the opening of the show as a funeral or a funeral maternity sometimes um and the smell was like fresh cut flowers is really like the smell of uh, funerals and maternity sometimes but after that is when the magic actually um happens it's when the the other beings accept or not your invitation, our invitation, and um, the unnamed entity starts to to transmutate in ways that we can't uh, predict. So I I would like to maybe take this um, um, this moment to ask you a little bit about your relationship to those other than human beings, um, um, and maybe I'm even gonna use one of the questions of the people in the in the audience um in a, in addition to what i just said uh tia jojima who's a, an amazing curator and researcher um here in new york uh, is asking daniel is communication important in your work can you talk about um your ways or processes of communicating with unnamed entities mm -hmm. so maybe you could Merge yep. those, two, those, those two questions in one answer. All, all these perceptions with this other than humans and even understanding that working in partnership comes from this slow research of making this installation and this works. And then I've been very of a work that changes throughout time. So in the beginning of it, it's very different from what you have at the end. Um, what you were referring to the opening, the vernissage being kind of like this funeral and maternity, it's very much well, how I have been perceiving the personality of this entity, the, the installation as a whole entity, because it's a conjunction of beings who are there, 
plants, bacteria, fungi, uh, molding, sprouting, all at the same time. And for those elements to go on track on these processes, it takes at least two weeks to a month. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to be there in New York because I live abroad, but this beginning is kind of like also the stances of the funeral or the maternity. When we are attending those, we don't quite sure what happened. To understand death, it takes time. The funeral is a very important ritual, but it takes time to understand the deepness of grieving. Just the same thing as a maternity, the baby is quite they're all very similar, but then it takes a few months so you can see the personalities in the face of this baby. The same thing I understand with installation, it takes time for all these elements go on track and then thus revealing the personality of this installation and how these means inform the creation of this space. And that takes me directly to this thought regarding communication. Uh, me speaking English, this language, it, it's not my, my mother tongue. And learning other languages is pretty much about how can I communicate with others? But it's not only about learning the language, but also learning the culture around it, learning the history around it, the other ways to shape my thoughts and my mind towards it. Specifically speaking in this accent that I was learning, which is from the US. Uh, and at the same time, what we're doing today here through this technology of the internet and the mechanisms, uh, we are communicating through voice. You can, if people can see me, uh, they can access to this image of myself right now. And this is informing how we are communicating at this moment right now, if you understand English at the same time too. I wonder what are the possibilities to communicate with these others? I understand that everything we're looking our, our from our surroundings comes from the human perspective. And I'm, I wonder if it's possible to have another perspective which is not human because the majority of these other beings, um, we still don't have a fluent conversation with them inside of this hegemonical uh, construction of thought. What I've been investigating with them is then then perhaps then the means of communication are more extended. We're, we're not gonna have a voice uh, communication as we're having right now, but what are the other uh, ways that we can perceive these beings? And once we perceive this being, is that already one type of communication? Once I feel the smell of them, is that they communicate with myself that they are alive? Uh, once I notice their presence there, their aesthetics, are they communicating with myself? If the environment is fully charged with spores and that changes the quality of the air and in past exhibition of mine, it may even be hard to breathe. Were they aware that I was there? And, but that takes me to the deepest question. What is the message? What are we communicating? And what I've been perceiving, and it's still an ongoing research then, uh, how to absorb this message. So uh, right after the work was ready um, and we were like a, a day before the opening, I had dreams with people that recently died and they um, gave me a hug. I dreamed with my grandfather who died 20 years ago, my Indonesian grandfather, and never dreamed with him before. And I was wondering, was that a sign that this communication has established? But Right now, the moment that I'm, right now I'm very interested in this learning process from the installation and how the installation can be a teacher, but also learning with people. So often I'm, I'm quite intrigued for people telling me what has their experience been like? Um, what were they feeling? Did uh, any memory went through their mind? Did uh, any process they went through it? Any at all, positive, negative, or neutral? Thus, I... But on my personal experience relating with this other than humans is very much about how can they give me agency to keep going. If I did an installation as an act of grieving and, and observing the transformation in time and, and, and be open to the mysteries that often happen in these installations, how that can be a source of me to continue staying in this world. So 
something I also understand that the, log the logic between human to human communication do not apply with them. And perhaps there is another one. I also find it's very important to acknowledge many uh, cultures and major minorities who have been constantly in this process of decolonization and pointing towards another way of existing beyond hegemony. And they are very much present in the Americas. Um, they have been very much involving and not creating a taboo towards this. Just to conclude, I also think this is very important to uh, review our perspective in the world and e exit a type of hierarchy that places humans at the center or at the top of the pyramid, uh, which is not the case at all. It's not, it's not the case at all. I, I think this openness is very important to be able to perceive and be in the world. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, and I and I think that there, there's um there's something interesting to maybe think about what is what is communication, right? Also, because um, it's not like, for example, I have a friend who's a a scientist. I think I told you that uh, then before was a scientist researching the communication of um, whales, and and their project, like multimillionaire projects, is how to translate what the whales are saying to human language, whatever that might be. Um, and their intention is to kind of create a technology to be able to translate what the aliens are going to tell us when they come. I think that's, that's not the kind of communication um, that we're trying to... Um, to to work with or think about in this in this show um at least uh, from what i understand in your, in your work then that is all there's also um focus on decentering human from the processes i think it's not so much about like how to translate things to uh human forms of language but more how to communicate in other forms that are not those that we um silence is very important yeah. silence is very important and also uh, me also as have uh, been indonesian it was a very crash between being half brazilian and half indonesian and then brazil being a, a, a verbal hijack with excess of speaking and sounds and then perceiving silence as the absence of communication the absence of sounds which is not the case there's a huge range of what silence can be and can mean, but also how much it's important uh, for that. For in previous exhi exhibitions that I did, we suggested people when they enter the space to not communicate through words. So perhaps withdrawing one of the main sources of communication, we can be more open towards the other perceptions. But it's not only focused in our head, but can also be focused on our skin. Uh, and, and thus, it's something that I suggest when people go just to take their time and be silent, which I sometimes we don't even need to suggest. Uh, and people already whisper inside of the space. Not all, I know this is also a common practice in museums, but often I don't work, do works in, in institutionalized spaces of art, uh, very uncommon space. And people often have that approach as well. And I wonder, well, but I never ask them to speak uh, in a whisper sense what made them to go in that place perhaps it's already like something that they are establishing I, I find quite intriguing which is a lot of people tell me that when they go to the the installation memories come childhood memories or that's a triggering process which at the moment i'm understanding what are the possibilities, the benefits, the qualities, uh, the uses of the installations for one. I, I have a lot for myself, but me also as a spectator of the work or somebody who's having a relationship with it. So in this period of time of these two weeks, I detach. I'm not interested to be in the one who's bringing the knowledge or bringing the concepts. When I'm also in, at the work, I'm there as a student as well. Sometimes I even feel like an employee of the installations, <laughs> but 
mostly as a student, sometimes as a mm-hmm. lover. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I think we also we also um, spoke about it in in the process of of this show how the narratives, how we conceive the relationships um, on the planet, they're so um, centered in a human. For example, we think human people are so so smart, so intelligent that they can like, you know, create agriculture, etc. But imagine the intelligence of a corn that manipulates humanity to spread corn all around the planet. So I think that's kind of that, that's kind of how I feel that you feel in relation to the work when you feel that you're used by the by the work to so the work can can exist, right? And well, already when we think another, about other animals, how the rats population in New York is bigger than the human population, how the, uh, the cattle population, cows and, and um, bulls population is bigger than the human population in Brazil. So also like these ratios that's quite interesting it's it's about like when a fly is flying around you to think mm-hmm. about this is also the world of this fly and what i'm bringing about the fly because usually the insect that we most despise because it's completely related with symbologies of rottenness death uh taboo uh so to remember that this is also the world of the fly uh, it's not only our world but and also reminding that there is like the layers of with within human who has the, the most right to be human as well within this hegemony this patriarchy this gender heteronormativeness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um i have um I have, we have many amazing questions um here in our q a um i'll just pick some so we can um address them there's one person, an, an anonymous attendee, that is asking us what happened to um, to all those beans and plants and mushrooms and etc. when the show is over. Mm-hmm. Where do all these yeah. materials go to? It's a constant concern. Initially, there was a moment in my work that I stopped working with um, materials worn. Uh, descendant from petroleum, like plastics, for instance. And then I brought the challenge of you know, only materials will change throughout time. There is always like, well, we can put the whole uh, installation in the compost here, and then we'll continue the process of rotting, of decaying, of sprouting, and whatsoever. Um, so right now that I have a base because I've been nomad for many years, that's also very much influencing the practice as well. Uh, for instance, there are materials in in the new museum who were actually used in the Berlin in the Berlin uh, exhibition, which I brought with myself, so some of the fabrics. And those materials, they will be shown again, but not as much like showing a painting or a portrait in a different exhibition, but more like, I feel sometimes like a, a theater play and you have the actors and then they tour a bit. And but other if that's not possible, we find people that would like to have the vases and and use them to plant, or they just go to the compost chair and decompose or we donate the materials. There's always a concern of like what's the ongoing life afterwards. So that's for sure one thing that we I've been constantly thinking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, go- I'm I'm going um, I'm going to read another another. Um, Question, but before that, I remember something important in what you said, and that was also part of uh, Chia's question, which is this relationship, this this idea of communication, um, because I think that there's an invitation in this show when when you call it a named entity, for people to relate to things without names, things without naming them. So there's, um, I just want to highlight here how you invite uh, people to relate to this work without using words without using categories that already exist how can you how what what can we discover when we relate to those things that we have without using names that we already know so i can um i can tell like someone that who has been seeing this show uh, for every day basically since the opening that the show is changing so much and there was this moment that we had this 
beautiful green color with all the plants is sprouting and then there's other moment with like i don't know but at least six or seven different species of mushrooms growing every day so fast that some people they 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 get to the space and they try to identify everything like this is that this is that this is that this is that this mushroom is that this mushroom is that and there's other people or people who spend like longer um in the show that they it starts to relate to the to the whole thing without trying to identify the elements but more trying to be with this thing without naming them and i think that's uh i've been having feedbacks that are very powerful from people who have been relating um to the work like that and i think this is also part of this um very specific intention of communication that the works proposes um and let me see. Um, there's a there's another question here about the color. Um, Maria Maria Baudehama, amazing, is asking in the Daniel in this installation, yellow is a very prevalent color, like the yellow curtains dyed with with turmeric and the stems and bunches of uh, yellow chrysanthemums. I interpreted them as death symbols. Can maybe can you talk a little about about um, this prevalence of the yellow in the work? Yeah, for sure. Um, and this challenge of coming out of like this material and using materials who have only be able to perish and, and decay. There is a moment. There was a moment that everything became like this scales of brown, and then on the creative level of like, well, what are the possibilities of bringing color? What are the possibilities of bringing materials who also have this quality of change? And then experimenting with turmeric, uh, understanding all the properties that this uh, plant-based uh, dye has uh, for our intake, but also the strength of it in the material is quite bright yellow. But then as time goes by, this yellow shifts. So you can have like in the beginning of the installation, if it's freshly dyed, this vivid yellow, strong, very bright, strong yellow. And then as time goes by, it becomes like faded and looks like a lot of time has gone by. The quality and the relationship with this color changes as much as the interpretation of this color. So that I find quite interesting. Uh, and that also is very much related with the space, how much the space receives of a direct light and how much that light uh, leaches out the, the, the color. And then what often happens in my process, I do the practice of the work, the, my dedication starts the, this practice, and then with time, I have some perceptions, more conceptions, perceptions of, of the work itself. Sometimes it takes two years for me to understand properly an image that I have proposed. Uh, nowadays, there are some things I've been thinking about the relationship with the color. And in, in, in Brazil, at least, when we talk about being Asian uh, descended, we use the word um, amarelo, which means yellow, uh, a yellow person or yellowness, which I don't, I don't know if in the context of the US is a proper word or not, but that's what we use in Brazil. Uh, something about it start to inform me as in other works I start to dedicate myself towards understanding properly the story of my Indonesian diaspora. Uh, other cultures also relate yellow as a, as a color of death. Um, people often tell me, but what I must say is those images are open symbology, are a complex of symbology. And what I'm very interested in actually is like, uh, this openness and the relationship with other people, people tell me their perspective towards. And that's when I become a student. So I, I heard that yellow was a color of death by presenting the work. And so I say, oh, in this culture, yellow is related with death. By thinking about yellowness is me talking with other uh, Asian descendants who have been born in Brazil. And we were talking about the complexity of being Latin and also Asian. Uh, so in, in this sense, uh, it, it, it still makes it going. So the work itself, it's a symbolical complex and the relationship is very much related with the time. 
so right now, at the moment, the exhibition is there. We're going to make relationships to what's going on in our environments. Uh, I'm, I'm highlighting that, that COVID is an other than human because we're being highly impacted by this pandemic. But if from a few years from now, we can take another perspective towards the work. So in this sense, for me, what I would like to conclude this moment now is like saying, uh, what I present there is, a, and what I bring there are complex of symbologies who have been present throughout our long, long history, history. But then how one from a different perspective can relate with it or not. And then super curious about what happens there. Amazing. There are so many amazing questions coming. Um, I'm very sorry that we are not gonna be able to, to read them all. I just want, want to maybe read one that you kind of already um, answered, but I, I would like to know if you if you have other things to to say about it because we're actually it's eight o'clock already. Um, Alessandra Pomari could um, share the, um, a question. She said, "I entered your space after spending hours and hours with the work of Faith Ringold. That was part." of the many uh, relations yes. that the experience opened up for me together yes. with the smell the bugs the presence of so many presences alive and death uh, and the same and at the same time i wonder if your work intersects also with questions of race um, in what constitute how perception works and influence how perception of time and existing as living beings in structural preconditions the, 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 the end of the question was a little bit confusing, but I think you got the, um, the idea. Well, first of all, it's like a complete honor to uh, go at the same period of time in the same institution with Ringold. Uh, we had an uh, encounter and Faith was able to enter the room and that for me was one of, perhaps one of the highest honors that I've had in my life. Uh, the context of the show of Faith was present as we were creating this, this installation, we were discussing about it. Uh, for me, all of these questions that are around my body, my existence, being transgender, being non-binary, being uh, the son of migrants, being a migrant myself, being um, a person who is questioning whiteness, a person who is also descended from white people, uh, a person who is questioning also yellowness and, and they're all very much present in my own um, political body. And me creating, reflecting, there are moments that's gonna be very much um, related with the work, but my work itself, the installations, they come from a lineage and descendants of research who are not so specific around those topics. There is a relationship, but at the same time, um, that's not the focus. I'm, I'm not discussing in those installations about those themes. Uh, and, and that, again, I come back a little bit what I was talking about, the importance of being a, a symbolic complex. Um, and that's also where I think the conversations, they stay. The works are not human uh, centric. The, the protagonism is not human, but we are as human, we're attending that. And then what does happen when we attend a space which is not human centric. Um, and then that's where I'm interested with the this conflict a bit. Yeah. I, wonder, I, hope, I hope I could answer your question. Yeah. Well, we have so many amazing questions here. I, ju I just want to thank um, everyone who, who shared your questions here. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to read, to read them all, but um, I'm going to share them with, uh, with Daniel after uh, this conversation. But I wanna um, uh, thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for your presence. Thank you, Danny, uh, so much for this, uh, this amazing show and this amazing conversation here tonight. I think it was, um, it's been really um, incredible. And I just wanna um, um, share once more the invitation for people who's in, the, in New York City to come see uh, unnamed entities uh, Daniel Lee's show at the New Museum together with Faith Wingo, American People, and screen series Patricia Dominguez. Two other amazing exhibitions that are, are happening, three amazing exhibitions that are happening at the same time here. Okay.
Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody being here. Thank you for your time. Just a last thing, like this exhibition is also the longest I have done in an indoor space. So usually I've done like for two months and a half and we're going for four months. So I think for now to the end, many things that I even don't know what's going to happen. So if you go to the show, uh, tag me on social media so I can also follow with you all what's happening that now there. I appreciate the new museum. I appreciate you, Bernard, so much. I appreciate all the staff. Uh, this conjoint effort has been a pleasure to do. Um, and without you all, this would not be possible. I acknowledge you all and I thank you so much. I thank specifically everybody who has been with us uh, tonight. And hopefully today we were able to make more questions rather than answering them. And I consider questions as a partner. So if you have really good questions that walk along our journey, and then we can always review our momentary answers. Thank you so much, everybody, for this time and tonight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.